A warning. A letter arrived for Sherlock Holmes. We were sitting in our rooms at two hundred and twenty-one B Baker Street. It's Porlock's writing, he said. It must be very important. Who is Porlock? I asked. Porlock is just a name. It's not his real one. He is a man who is in touch with the great criminal mastermind, Professor Moriarty. You've heard me talk about him. Yes, he's famous among criminals, but unknown to the public. That's right. He's the brain that controls all crime. We'll catch him one day, Watson. Anyway, what about this letter and Porlock? He works for Professor Moriarty. He has sent me information twice before, which has helped to prevent crimes. Holmes opened the letter and read it. The message said that a man called Douglas at Burlston Manor House was in great danger. There was a knock at the door, and Inspector Macdonald of Scotland Yard walked in. Holmes looked pleased to see him. "You're out early," he said. But the inspector had stopped suddenly. He was staring at the message. Douglas, Bullstone, what's this, Mister Holmes? Magic? How did you get those names? Why? Asked Holmes. What's wrong with those names? Mister Douglas of Bullstone Manor House was murdered this morning. Sherlock Holmes explained to the inspector how he had just received the letter. I was on my way to Burlston," said the inspector. "I came to ask if you and Doctor Watson wanted to come with me. But from what you say about this Porlock, we'll find out more in London." "I don't think so," said Holmes. "Well, if there's a man in London who knew about the crime before it happened, then we need to find him." And how do you suggest we find Porlock? Asked Holmes. I don't know him. I've never seen him. I don't know where he is, and what's more, I know that Professor Moriarty is involved. We'll find nothing in London, Macdonald. We must go to Burlston to solve this crime. The inspector stood up. Let's go. Can you be ready in five minutes? On our way down to Burlston, the inspector told us what he knew about the case, which was not very much. John Douglas of Burlston Manor House was shot in the head with a shotgun. It happened at around midnight the night before. The police had not yet arrested anyone. Burlston was a small village in Sussex. About half a mile from the village was the manor house of Burlston. It was a very old house built in the seventeenth century. A moat surrounded the house. The only way to get into the house was over the drawbridge. This drawbridge was raised every night and lowered every morning by the owners of the manor house. This meant that the house was like an island during the night. This was a very important fact in the mystery at Burlston. The owners were Mr. John Douglas and his wife. Douglas was a handsome American man, about fifty years old. He was popular in the village because he was friendly and also rich. He had earned his money in California, then came to live in England, where he met his wife. Mrs. Douglas was a beautiful woman, about twenty years younger than her husband. They were very happy together. Although it seemed that Mrs. Douglas did not know everything about her husband's past, there was one other person who often stayed with the couple and was also at the manor house at the time of the murder. His name was Cecil Barker. He was a good friend of John Douglas and was the only person from Douglas's unknown past life. Although Barker was English, he had met John Douglas in America. Barker was friendly with both Douglas and his wife. Sometimes his friendship with Mrs. Douglas seemed to irritate John Douglas.
The other people who were in the house at the time of the murder were Ames, the butler, and Mrs. Allen, the housekeeper. It was at eleven forty-five at night on the sixth of January that Cecil Barker told Sergeant Wilson at the local police station that someone had murdered Mr. John Douglas. When he reached the house, Sergeant Wilson found the drawbridge down, and everyone was confused and alarmed. Only Cecil Barker seemed calm and in control. The dead man was in the centre of the room. Lying on his back, the shotgun was lying on his chest. The end of the gun was sawn off. The murderer had fired the gun very close to his victim, and the shot had almost blown his head to pieces. The doctor was called, but he knew there was nothing he could do. The country policeman was not used to such serious crime. We won't touch anything until the officers from London arrive," he said. "I haven't touched anything," said Cecil Barker. "This is exactly as I found it. It was just after half past eleven, and I was sitting in my bedroom when I heard the shot. It wasn't very loud. I rushed down. Was the door open? Yes, it was open. Douglas was lying just as you see him now." There was a candle burning on the table. I lit the lamp. Did you see anyone? No. I heard Mrs. Douglas coming down the stairs behind me, and I rushed out to stop her from seeing this terrible sight. But wasn't the drawbridge raised as usual? Yes, it was up until I lowered it," said Barker. "Then how could the murderer have got away? Look." Barker pulled back the curtain. One of the windows was wide open. Look at this. He pointed to a bloodstain that was shaped like a footprint. Someone has climbed out here. You think that someone waded across the moat? Exactly. Well, you were in the room half a minute after the murder, so this means that he was in the water then. I know. I didn't know the window was open because it was hidden by the curtain. The policeman was thinking. You're saying that the man escaped by wading across the moat, but how did he get into the house if the drawbridge was up? That's a good question," agreed Barker. Murder at Burlston. What time was the bridge raised? Asked the policeman. It was six o'clock," said Ames, the butler. Mrs. Douglas had visitors, so I raised it after they left. So, if anyone came in from outside, if they did, then they came into the house before six and hid there until Mr. Douglas came into the room at about eleven o'clock. That's right. Mr. Douglas always checked all the lights in the house before he went to bed. He came in here, where the man was waiting to shoot him. Then the murderer got away through the window and left the gun behind. That's what I think. The policeman picked up a card which was lying on the floor beside the dead man. The initials V V and the number three hundred and forty-one were written on the card. What's this? Asked the policeman. Barker looked at it. I didn't notice it before. The murderer probably left it behind. V V three hundred and forty-one. What does it mean? Somebody's initials, maybe. The policeman walked slowly around the room. He pulled back a window curtain. Look at this, he said excitedly. Someone was hiding here. Look at these muddy footprints. What's this mark on his arm? Asked the doctor. On the dead man's right arm. Was a strange brown design, a triangle inside a circle. It's not a tattoo," said the doctor. "I've never seen anything like it. This mark has been burnt onto the man. What does it mean? I don't know what it means, but Douglas has had that mark for at least ten years," said Cecil Barker. "Yes," agreed the butler.
I've often noticed it and wondered what it is. Then it has nothing to do with the crime, anyway," said the policeman. It was made in America. The butler says he has never seen it in the house before. It suggests that the stranger who entered the house and killed Douglas is American. MacDonald shook his head. I've heard nothing that proves that a stranger was even in the house. What about the open window? The blood by the window, the muddy footprints—they are all things which can be set up. The business with the ring and the card suggests premeditated murder for a private reason. But why would the murderer choose such a noisy weapon if he wanted to get away unnoticed? What do you think, Holmes? It does seem strange," agreed Holmes. We walked through the village towards Burlston Manor. Sergeant Wilson was still there. Anything new? Mason asked the policeman. No, sir. Then go home.、Uh, you're tired. The butler can wait outside. Tell Cecil Barker and Mrs. Douglas we want to talk to them in a short while. Now I'll tell you what I think so far. I think it's murder. The question is, was it done by someone from outside or inside the house? It doesn't seem likely that it was someone inside the house. They did it at a time when the house was quiet, but no one was asleep, and used the noisiest weapon possible, which hasn't been seen inside the house before. He asks for the wedding ring. We don't know why, but it seems so. Mr. Douglas gives it to him. Then the man shoots Douglas. He drops the gun and this card, VV three hundred and forty-one, whatever that means, and then escapes through the window and across the moat. Just as Cecil Barker discovers the crime. How does that sound, Mr. Holmes? Interesting, but not very believable," said Holmes.、Uh, what's your theory then, Holmes? I'd like a few more facts before I come up with a theory," said Holmes. Ames,、uh, can you come in here for a moment, please? The butler came in. Now you've seen this mark on Mr. Douglas's arm before. Often, sir," agreed Ames. There is also a small piece of plaster on Mr. Douglas's chin. Did you see that when he was alive?" asked Holmes. "Yes, sir." He cut himself shaving yesterday morning," said Ames. "Did he often cut himself shaving?" asked Holmes. "Not for a very long time, sir." "Interesting," said Holmes. "This might mean he was nervous and knew that he was in danger. Did you notice anything unusual in his behaviour yesterday, Ames?" "He did seem a bit nervous, sir," said the butler. "So." Perhaps the attack wasn't unexpected then. Now, what about the card, VV three hundred and forty-one? What do you think that means, Macdonald? It seems like a secret society of some sort. The people of the drama. The bicycle was hidden behind some bushes. Well, it's something," said Mason. "But why has the man left it behind?" How did he get away without it? We are no closer to solving this mystery, Holmes. Aren't we? Answered Holmes thoughtfully. We moved to the dining room to hear evidence from the people who were in the house at the time of the murder. Ames, the butler, told us what he had heard and seen. He had not heard the shot because he was at the back of the house in the kitchen. He heard the ringing of the bell, which called for the servants of the house. He and the housekeeper went to the front of the house together. When they got to the bottom of the stairs, Mrs. Douglas was coming down. She was not hurrying, and she did not seem agitated. Then Mr. Barker came rushing out of the study, telling Mrs. Douglas to go back. Barker thought that Douglas was in some danger. He thought that a secret society was after John and wanted to kill him. How long were you together in California? Asked Macdonald. Five years altogether," said Barker. 
and he was a widower. You said. Do you know where his first wife was from? He asked. No, but I saw a picture of her. She was a very beautiful woman. She died the year before I met him. Was there anything strange about him in California? Only that he didn't like to be near other men. That's why I thought someone was after him. I think he had a warning of some sort. That's why he left so suddenly for Europe. Only a few days after he left, some men were asking about him," said Barker. "That was six years ago. Before that, you were together for five years in California. Eleven years is a long time to keep a fight going. It was definitely something serious." Have you found anything out yet? She asked. We're doing all we can, Mrs. Douglas. Perhaps you may be able to help us. Mr. Barker said that you were never actually in the room where the tragedy took place. That's right. He told me to go back to my room. You have only known your husband in England, is that right? Yes, we've been married for five years. Have you heard him speak of something that happened in America, which may be dangerous for him? Mrs. Douglas thought carefully before answering. Yes, she said finally. I have always felt that there was some sort of danger from his past, but he didn't talk to me about it. How did you know then? Asked the detective. In many ways, she replied. Because of the way he didn't talk about some parts of his life in America, because of some of the things he said, the way he looked at strangers, I always felt sure that he had some powerful enemies, and that he was always ready to defend himself. What sort of things did he say? Asked Sherlock Holmes. The Valley of Fear, replied Mrs. Douglas. He said. I have been in the Valley of Fear, and I'm not out of it yet. The missing dumbbell. Holmes called the butler in. Yes, Mister Holmes. He had a pair of bedroom slippers on. I brought him his boots when he went for the police. Where are the slippers now? They are still under a chair in the hall. Good. It's important to know which footprints belong to Mr. Barker and which come from outside. Yes, sir. I noticed that the slippers were marked with blood, sir. So were mine. Thank you, Ames. We returned to the study. Holmes brought the slippers with him from the hall. The slippers were dark with blood. Strange," said Holmes. He was examining the slippers by the light of the window. Very strange indeed. He placed the slipper on the blood stain under the window. It matched exactly. Holmes looked at the others. Macdonald looked excited. Barker made the mark under the window himself. What's going on, Holmes? What does it mean? That's the question," said Holmes. "What does it mean?" The three detectives had many small details to investigate. I decided to return to the village on my own. I walked through the garden of the house. At the far end was a hedge of yew trees. Behind these was a stone seat, hidden from view. As I approached, I heard some voices coming from the area of the stone seat. I came around the trees and saw Mrs. Douglas and Mr. Barker. They did not see me straight away. I was shocked by Mrs. Douglas's appearance. Before she had been very quiet. Now her eyes were shining, and she was laughing at something Barker had just said. Barker was also smiling. Just too late, they both saw me and assumed more serious expressions. They spoke briefly to each other. Then Barker got up and walked towards me. Excuse me, sir, but are you Doctor Watson? Mrs. Douglas wants to ask you something. I did not really want to talk to her. I saw clearly in my mind the body of the dead man lying on the floor. 
Here, only a few hours after the tragedy, was his wife laughing with another man. <sighs> But I went over to them. You're a good friend of Mr. Holmes. I'm sure there is something going on between those two. I agreed. Do you think they are guilty of the murder? I asked. I think that Mr. Barker and Mrs. Douglas know the truth about this murder. I am not sure that they are the murderers themselves. I think that an evening alone in the study will help a lot. Can I borrow your umbrella, please, Watson? I was confused, but I gave him my umbrella anyway. Later that evening, Inspector Macdonald and Mr. Mason returned. The mystery is solved. The next morning, the detectives were trying to find the owner of the bicycle. Any luck? Asked Holmes. Well, so far we have reports of a man in a yellow coat in Leicester, Nottingham, Southampton, and Liverpool. But the country seems to be full of people in yellow coats. Replied Macdonald. What about you? Did you find out anything last night? I can't really tell you at the moment. However, I have found out that Charles the First was once hidden in this house for several days during the Civil War," said Holmes. "I don't see what that has to do with this case," said Mason. "Well, I want to give you both some advice. I can't tell you everything that I know yet, but my advice to you is to abandon the case for today." Meet me here this evening, and things will become clear. The detectives were not very happy about this, but eventually agreed. One more thing, I want you to write a letter to Mr. Barker.、Uh, write this down, dear sir. We have decided to drain the moat in the hope that we may find some. Macdonald interrupted. It's impossible. We've already made inquiries. In the hope that we may find something which will help in the case, I have made arrangements, and the workmen will begin tomorrow morning. Now sign that and deliver it this afternoon. Then meet me here when it gets dark. The detectives were obviously annoyed, but agreed to do as Holmes asked. Perhaps the V V on the card might stand for Vermissa Valley. And may even be the Valley of Fear. I think this seems clear. Perhaps you could explain further, Mister Barker. Asked Holmes. Barker did not know what to say. Eventually, he said, "Well, if you know such a lot, Holmes, why don't you tell us?" Missus Douglas came in. She had heard everything. You have done enough for us, Cecil. Whatever happens in the future, you have done enough. More than enough," said Holmes. "Now I think it is time to hear the truth from Mister Douglas himself." We were all astonished at Holmes's words. As he spoke, a man seemed to have come out from the wall in a dark corner of the room. Missus Douglas turned and put her arms around her husband. "I'm sure it's best this way, John," she said. The man looked at us. He came to me and gave me a package. "I've heard of you," he said. "Well, Doctor Watson, you've never heard a story like this one. Tell it your own way, but these are the facts. I've been hiding in there for two days, and I've written it all down. Then, when I was checking the lights before going to bed, I saw his boot under the curtain." I put down the candle, and he jumped out at me and got the gun from under his coat. We were fighting, and I was trying to take the gun out of his hands before he could fire. Maybe it was me that pulled the trigger, or maybe it just went off in the fight. Anyway, he took the shot full in the face. I was looking at all that was left of Ted Baldwin. I was in shock when I heard Barker and my wife coming. I ran to the door and stopped her. We thought that the servants would be there any minute, but they didn't come. They hadn't heard anything. That was when I thought of the plan. The man has the same mark as I have—the mark of the lodge. He was also about the same height and size as me. His face was unrecognizable. 
We tied his clothes to the dumbbell and threw them out of the window. Then we put my clothes on him. Vermissa It was the 4th of February, 1875. It was evening, and the train was travelling to Vermissa, USA, the small town at the top of the valley. The train was full of miners who had been working all day. In the first carriage, there were also two policemen and one other young man sitting alone. He was about thirty years old, with brown hair and grey eyes. He stared out of the window into the darkness. At one point, he took a large gun from his pocket. It was loaded. He checked it quickly, then replaced it but a miner sitting near him had noticed it. Oh, he said. You seem ready for action. The young man smiled. Yes, he said. We need them sometimes where I come from. And where's that? asked the miner. Chicago, answered the young man. You might find that you need it here, too. Is that right? asked the young man, surprised. I'm looking for work here. Do you have friends here? No, but I can make them, answered the young man. I belong to the ancient order of freemen. There's no town without a lodge, so I'll find my friends there. The other man's manner changed. He got up, came over to sit next to the young man, and held out his hand. The two men shook hands in a special way. I see you're telling the truth, said the miner. Then he raised his right hand to his right eyebrow. The young traveller raised his left hand to his left eyebrow. Dark nights are unpleasant, said the miner. Yes, for strangers to travel, answered the young man. That's good enough for me. A few minutes later, the train stopped at Vermissa Station, and McMurdo and many of the other miners got off the train. McMurdo was about to walk off when one of the miners stopped him. You really know how to talk to the police, he said admiringly. I'm passing by Shafter's place. Let me carry a bag and I'll show you where it is. Many of the other miners said good night as they left. Before he had even arrived in the town, Jack McMurdo had a reputation in Vermissa. The two men walked along. That's the Union House, said the miner, pointing to one of the bigger buildings. Jack McGinty is the boss there. What's he like? Haven't you heard of him? He's been in the papers often enough because of the Scourers. The Scourers? Aren't they a group of murderers? Asked McMurdo. Shh! cried the miner. You won't last long here if you talk like that, on the streets so that anyone can hear you. There are murders, but McGinty's name mustn't be connected with them. He hears everything. Now, here's Jacob Shafter's house. Thanks, said McMurdo. Meeting Boss McGinty One evening, Mike Scanlon came to see McMurdo. McMurdo, why haven't you been to introduce yourself to Master McGinty? He asked. I had to find a job replied McMurdo. I'm working as a bookkeeper now. Scanlon seemed worried. But you have to see Boss McGinty, he said. The lodge isn't the same here as it is in Chicago. Go tonight. But someone else wanted to talk to McMurdo that evening. Mr. Shafter called McMurdo into his room and asked him about his feelings for Etty, his daughter. It's no good, McMurdo said the old man. Who are these scourers? Why are you all so afraid of them? The scourers are the ancient order of free man, replied the old man. But I belong to that order myself, said McMurdo. You? I wouldn't have let you into my house if I had known that. But why? The order is for charity and friendship. The rules say so. Maybe in some places. But not here, said the old man. Here they are a group of murderers. Etty jumped to her feet, looking alarmed. I'm glad to see you, Mr. Baldwin. You're early. Please sit down. 
Mr. Baldwin did not sit down. Who's he? He demanded. Etty explained that McMurdo was staying with them. Well, McMurdo, this young lady is mine. Perhaps she told you. No, I didn't know there was anything between you. Well, you know now, replied Baldwin. Perhaps you are ready for a fight, Mr. McMurdo. McMurdo jumped up. I am, he cried. Come on outside. Oh, Jack, Jack, be careful! He'll hurt you! Cried Etty. Oh, it's Jack, is it? I see how it is. Well, I'll sort this out without getting into a fight. He rolled up his sleeve and showed McMurdo a strange mark on his arm. It was a triangle inside a circle. Do you know what that means? I don't know, and I don't care. Well, you will know. I promise you that. McGinty looked surprised, but then he took McMurdo to a back room. He sat down and, without saying a word, examined McMurdo carefully. For a couple of minutes, he sat in silence. Then, suddenly, he pulled out a gun. If this is a game of yours, it won't last long," said McGinty dangerously. "That is a strange welcome from one brother to another," replied McMurdo calmly. "That's just what you have to prove that you really are a brother." McGinty then asked him some details about where he was made a freeman and the reason why he had left Chicago. McMurdo gave him a page from a newspaper. McGinty read it quickly. It was about the shooting of a man called Jonas Pinto in the Lake Bar in Chicago in January 1874. Did you shoot this man? Asked McGinty. Why? I was making fake dollars. This man Pinto was helping me. Then he said he wanted to go to the police. Maybe he did, but I didn't wait to see. Lodge three hundred and forty-one, Vermissa. The next day, McMurdo moved from Jacob Shafter's and went to stay with Mrs. McNamara, who was a widow. Scanlan now also worked in Vermissa, and so he stayed at the same house. McMurdo was still allowed to go for meals with the Shafters, so his relationship with Etty continued to develop. One Saturday night, McMurdo was made a full brother of the lodge in Vermissa. He was warned that something might happen to him, but he did not know what it was. Many men had gathered for the ceremony. McMurdo was tied up and blindfolded. Then they took off his coat and rolled up the sleeve on his right arm. There was a circle with a triangle in it, burnt deep and red onto his arm. So now to business," said McGinty. "How's our bank balance?" And so McMurdo learnt of the way this community worked. Small companies gave money to the order so that they were protected. If they did not give money, machinery went wrong, buildings burnt down, and men were murdered. Nothing could be proved against the order, as most of the policemen were paid by the society, and the others were too scared to do anything. Nobody wanted to give evidence against the order. But towards the end of the meeting, another man spoke. Brother Morris told them of how one large company had forced all the smaller companies out of the valley and bought their businesses. I don't see that it matters to us who has bought the businesses, Brother Morris," said Boss McGinty. McGinty read the article to the men, who were by now drunk and restless. That's what he says about us. Now what shall we say to him? He shouted, "Kill him!" Shouted back many voices. No, we must be careful, but he must get a severe warning. Ordered McGinty. Who will go this evening? Ted Baldwin volunteered with five or six other men. Take our new brother with you, added McGinty. Baldwin did not look pleased. You can come if you want. He said to McMurdo, "It was a very cold night. The men walked through the town and stopped outside a high building. You stay down here, McMurdo. Watch the door," said Baldwin. "You others, come with me. 
the men went in and up some stairs. From the room above came a cry for help. Then the sound of crashing chairs. The Valley of Fear. When McMurdo woke up the next morning, his head ached and his arm was very painful from the mark. Because he had his own illegal way of making money, he did not always go to work, and this morning was one of those times. He sat and read the paper. There was an article about last night's events. Editor seriously injured at the Herald office was the headline. McMurdo put down the newspaper. The landlady brought him a note. It read, "I want to speak to you. Meet me on Miller Hill." I have something important to tell you. The note was not signed. McMurdo was surprised, but decided to go. When he got to the hill, Brother Morris was waiting for him. I wanted to ask you something. But please don't tell Boss McGinty. When you joined the Free Men's Society, did you think that it would lead you to a life of crime? He asked. If you call it crime, said McMurdo. Some call it war. Of Wait, and you'll see. I'll tell you when I've seen more. You're not the man for this place. That's clear. Why don't you sell your business and leave? What you have said is safe with me. I'm going now. Just one thing. Perhaps someone has seen us together. McGinty will want to know what we're talking about. Tell him that I offered you a job in my shop. Good thinking, and I refused your offer. Goodbye, Brother Morris. The same afternoon, McGinty came to McMurdo's house and asked why he had been with Morris. McMurdo told him the story. Did Morris say anything against the lodge? Asked McGinty. McMurdo told him that he had not. Just as McGinty was about to leave, the door crashed open, and Captain Marvin of the police walked in with two other policemen. You're coming with me, McMurdo. Take his gun," said Marvin. "What have I done?" asked McMurdo. "You can't do this," said McGinty. "You stay out of this, Counselor," said the policeman. Then he turned to McMurdo. She decided to go and see him one last time to try to get him away from the evil influence of the lodge. But I've thought of that. Father has some money saved up. And he is ready to leave this place. Let's go together to New York or Philadelphia. But they have lodges there too. We can't get away that easily," said McMurdo. "Well, to England or Sweden or anywhere to get away from this valley of fear." Look, Eddie. The best I can say is that in six months or so, I'll find a way so that we can leave here with no problems. Really, six months? Eddie was happy. Is that a promise? I promise," said McMurdo. Life in the valley continued as before. The scourers murdered people and terrorized the district. McMurdo was given a job of his own to do. He had to blow up the house of a man named Chester Wilcox. There was no other way of doing it except at night, when his wife and two small children were also in the house. McMurdo set the explosives, and the house blew up. However, someone had told Wilcox that he was in danger, and the night before the explosion, he and his family moved to a safe place. Birdie Edwards's trap. Later that evening, McMurdo went to the lodge. As it was Saturday, the brothers were already there. Jack went to his seat. Master, he said. I have urgent news. McMurdo told them what he knew and what he planned to do about it. There's only one answer," said McMurdo. "Birdie Edwards must never leave the valley," said Baldwin. "Exactly," agreed McMurdo. "Here's what we'll do." He told them his plan. Birdie Edwards was pretending to be a journalist called Steve Wilson. He had spoken to McMurdo, offering him money for information on the Scourers. McMurdo had told him some stories that he had made up, and Wilson gave him twenty dollars. 
Wilson offered him more money for more information. McMurdo arranged for Wilson to come to his house so that he could tell him all the secrets of the lodge in exchange for more money. Wilson was to come to Mrs. McNamara's house at ten o'clock. The house was isolated, and Mrs. McNamara did not hear very well. Birdie Edwards was inside. The door opened, and McMurdo reappeared. He came to the end of the table and looked at the men. He said nothing. Well, said McGinty impatiently, is he here? Yes, replied McMurdo slowly. Bertie Edwards is here. I am Bertie Edwards. The room was silent. Then the windows were suddenly broken and guns were pointing in through them. McGinty jumped up from his chair and ran for the door, but Captain Marvin of the police appeared and pointed his gun at him. Stay where you are, McGinty, said the man they had known as McMurdo. Take their guns, Marvin. The men could do nothing. They were trapped. They sat around the table, staring at McMurdo with confusion and hatred in their eyes. I'd like to speak to you before we leave, said the man who had trapped them. I am Bertie Edwards of Pinkerton's Detective Agency. I was chosen to break up your gang. It's taken me a long time, and it's been hard and dangerous. But I've won. Maybe you think the game isn't over yet. Ten days later, Etty and Bertie Edwards were married in Chicago. The trial of the Scourers was held, and McGinty was hanged along with eight others. Many other men went to prison. Bertie Edwards' job was done. But... As he had thought, it was not over. Ted Baldwin was not sentenced to death. He was in prison for ten years, but when he came out, he spent all his time looking for Birdie Edwards. Birdie Edwards changed his name again and moved to California, and it was there that Etty Edwards died. He took the name John Douglas and was nearly killed when he was working in the mining industry with an English partner named Barker. A warning came just in time, and Douglas left for England, where he married for the second time. And so we return to Sussex, and the fate of John Douglas. At the trial, John Douglas was freed for having acted in self-defence, but Holmes's advice was to leave England. Two months had gone by, and we had nearly forgotten about the case. But then, one night, a message arrived for Holmes. Thank you for watching this video. Please like, share and subscribe to the channel to see the latest videos. Thank you.